Good morning. My name is Todd Korahai, and I'm going to be uh, teaching this morning. We're here at the home of Scott and Patricia Farrell for Encounter Christ Worship Services. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Today is Sunday, uh, December 15th, and we're going to be talking this morning about the holiday season and what the holiday season is. So I'm glad you're here today. And like I said, my name is Todd Korahai. It's here to be at Encounter. It's been a, a true privilege to uh, get to know Scott and Patricia and um, watch their ministry as, as they uh, teach and be a part of it and learn from them. And I hope we uh, have a chance to uh, spend some time this morning and, and learn together. So what we're going to be talking about this morning and bringing attention to is uh, the holiday season as we know it. So as, as I normally do in, in my teachings, I always ask everyone in, in the listening audience, uh, both here and at home, to uh, agree to a couple things. Uh, thing number one, I want you to believe absolutely nothing that I say. Your job is to take your notes from today or take today's message and uh, open up your Bible and study it for yourself. Um, when you stand before the Lord, it's going to be what you and the relationship that you and God have. And His Word is rich in... Um and just open up your Bible and work it out for yourself. So what we're going to be talking about today is the holiday season. And we're going to start out with Ephesians chapter 2. I start out quite often, as a matter of fact. All the verses for today are up here. So we're going to start out with Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. And here's what it says, and you're probably familiar with it, as most people are. For, grace, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision, is the flesh made in the flesh made by hands. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. So we always begin there, and let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we just pause to say thank you that we can open up your word and that you've uh, given us a way uh, through your Son to be reconciled with you and to ultimately go home and, and be with you. Father, between now and then, just pour out uh, a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of knowledge, and, and make us walk in the commandments and make us walk like your Son in all that we do in thought and word and deed. Father, we love you and give you praise and glory through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. So Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you're saved by grace through faith, not of works. So what does that mean? It is faith unto salvation. Now, as believers, we're called to do good works. And the question often is uh, brought up, well, if we're doing good works, then isn't that saved by works? No. No, what we have to do is we always have to begin with a foundation, and the foundation is this. It is faith unto salvation. And the purpose of good works or obedience to do the work God has called us to do, to blessings and rewards. It's blessings in this life and inheritance in the next life, a reward in the kingdom. Okay? So there are certain things that happen in the holiday season, and we're going to talk about them. There's a lot of rituals that take place. So let me ask you a question. Um, does someone have it? No. Is it a great ritual? Absolutely. We saw that our Lord was baptized. We, we are actually, actually commanded to go out and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Baptism is a ritual. It's based upon a biblical principle, not necessary unto salvation. Tithing. Do you have to tithe to be saved? If you ask certain preachers, it's yes. I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> teasing. <laughs> No, you do not have to tithe to be saved, okay? Um, are, are we commanded to tithe? Yes, we are. God, in fact, God's um, quite clear about it. If we don't give the first tenth unto Him, we're stealing. We're robbing from Him, okay? 
So we tithed, we tithe not to be saved. We tithe because we are saved and we're being obedient. Now comes blessings. God promises in Malachi chapter 3 that if you give him the 10th, then he will open up the window of heaven and pour out blessing. Okay. So rituals like baptism. Do you have to be baptized to be saved? No, you do not. Is it a fantastic ritual? And I believe God will bless you. God will protect you. God will give you the promises of God as given out by the word of God. So we are not to be, be, to be obedient to be saved. We are obedient because we seek the blessings of God, because we love God, we want to obey God, and we want to do the things God has called us to do. Well, that's great. So let's talk about what it says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It says, you are, in verse 12, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. So oftentimes when I say that, people say, well, wait a minute. Um, if I'm in Israel, does that make me Jewish? The answer is no. Okay. Who is Israel? Well, if we go to Ge uh, Genesis chapter 32, we're going to see who Israel is. So turn in your iPhones to Genesis chapter 32, <laughs> beginning in verse 24. Now, let me set this, the stage for you. Uh, Jacob is by himself. He has sent his uh, family, his flocks, his herds, his children, his, uh, all his people um, um, away from him. He's, he's alone. Uh, he's spending the night by himself. And it's verse 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go. For the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let you go except that you bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. So Jacob, by definition, just means wrestles with God, struggles with God. Israel means to wrestle and struggle with God. So when you were saved, you were grafted into Israel. Your new spirit wants to walk in purpose and fellowship with God. And your flesh wrestles and struggles with God. And that's what it means to be human. And that's what it means to have this struggle. And God says, I understand that. Now, if you wrestle with me and you continue on, and you overcome sin in your life, I will continue to bless you. Now, for some people that seems to be contradictory because some people um, view that the battle's done, Christ is won, we've overcome sin and death. That's true. Look at it like this. The war is over. The battle still rages on. Let me give you an example. The other day, Clemson beat Virginia 62 to 17. <laughs> By the fourth quarter, that game was over. But pay respect to Virginia. They, they battled on until the end. Okay? So even though the game was over, they continued to play. Even though victory has been declared, Christ has overcome we are still in the battle. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We have to continue to wrestle and struggle because our spirit man has been pronounced a victor in Christ. And our flesh is still battling day in and day out. And I was um, reminded of a story where a new believer was at a, 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 a conference, a Bible conference, and the gentleman at the podium speaking was an elderly gentleman. He was in his 80s. I believe he was 86, and a new, the new believer raised his hand and he said, I'm, I'm new in the faith, I just, I just have a question, I'm, I'm still struggling with sin, when does it end? And the wise and venerable gentleman at the, at the podium said, son, I'm not exactly sure, I'm, I'm just positive it's sometime after 86. <laughs> so we have to recognize that 
we're grafted into Israel and that Jacob had 12 sons and there was 12 tribes. Okay. There was a Northern kingdom that was known as Israel. There was 10 tribes. There was a Southern kingdom that was known as Judah. Now in the book of Romans, we're going to go to Romans chapter 11 or in Romans chapter 11, the entire chapter explains you are grafted into Israel. Okay. Doesn't mean you're Jewish. It just means you are grafted into God's people. The Jewish people are a subset of Israel. The Jewish people were three tribes, Benjamin, uh, Judah, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Okay. So the Northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians around 722 BC. And they were, uh, gone in, went into exile, not to return the Southern kingdom, Judah, Jews were conquered by Babylon around 583 BC and spent 70 years in Babylon. Okay. So what we're going to talk about is what happened there. The Northern kingdom, Israel was divorced. We can read in Hosea where we see that the Northern kingdom, Israel was divorced by God and that only when a man dies, can, can the bride remarried? Well, a man died and to reconcile Israel back to her husband, to God, uh, a substitute died in its place. And that's our Lord. For that, we have thanks and gratitude and we give him praise and honor. The Southern kingdom returned 70 years later. They were not divorced. They returned to Jerusalem 70 years later. During that time, God's people, before the, the, um, the exile, God's people were given feasts. Okay. And I'm going to draw an example of those feasts or a word picture of those feasts for you. The first feast is called Passover. At Passover, a lamb was crucified. We see uh, when John the Baptist was baptizing and Jesus came on the scene, he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, the lamb of God was sacrificed at Passover. He was buried at the feast of unleavened bread. And we learned that the bread in the temple, the bread in the tabernacle, it's called the table of shoe bread, had 12 loaves on it, one for each of the 12 tribes. And the bread was covered in frankincense, which the wise men brought when they brought gifts, the Magi. And he said, this is my body, take and eat. His body was covered in frankincense. It was a, uh, an anointing oil for burial. Okay. And then we have the feast of first fruits and the feast of first fruits represents his resurrection. So we see his death, his burial and his resurrection. And this represents his first coming. Okay. His first coming when he came as the, the, the lamb of God. He died at Passover, his death. He was buried at unleavened bread, his burial. He was resurrected at first fruits, death, burial, resurrection, first fruits. 50 days later, we have the feast of Pentecost. And at Pentecost came the Holy Spirit. So this is his first coming. This is where Christ demonstrates his leaving so much so that the Holy Spirit could come. So the Holy Spirit comes and Christ leaves. I heard a very interesting teaching on that. If we read in the Bible, it's clear that a matter has to be established in the presence of two or three witnesses. Two witnesses were in the kingdom at all times. When Christ came, the Holy Spirit and the Father were in the kingdom. When Christ ascended in the Holy Spirit came down, the Father and Christ were in the kingdom bearing witness at all times, so much so that they could make judgment. Yeah, very interesting teaching. All right, then we have his second coming, and his second coming are the fall feasts. His first coming are the spring feasts, and we know that Pentecost happens in the summer. This usually happens in April. This usually happens in the Feast of Trumpets, which usually happens in September, October timeframe in the fall. Then we have 
Day of Atonement, which is also known as Yom Kippur. That was the one day where the high priest could go behind the curtain in the tabernacle and approach the Ark of the Covenant. That was the one day where man and God met, and just like Jacob met. God face to face and lived. And then the last one is the Feast of Tabernacles. Represents the thousand year reign of Christ where we will, the lion will lay down with the lamb. They will beat their swords into plowshares. There'll be peace on earth for a thousand, peace on earth for a thousand years because the adversary will be bound. So we see that his first coming is outlined in the spring feast, his death, burial, resurrection. The coming of the Holy Spirit and Christ ascending into heaven uh, happens at Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit came to dwell with men. Then we have the Feast of Trumpets, which uh, marks the beginning of the seven years of tribu tribulation, the Day of Atonement, which uh, is the day Christ returns, and then the Feast of Tabernacles when he sets up the thousand year reign of Christ. Spring, summer, fall. So, what happens in the winter? God's just a summer kind of guy. You know, he's just. Um... Well, interestingly enough, um, something did happen in the winter. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. These feasts are all about one person, one character, Christ. He came as the Lamb of God and He will return as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. In like a, in, in like a lamb, out like a lion. Or came as a lamb, returning as a lion. His death, His burial, His resurrection... This represents his second coming. This represents him fulfilling the promise that he would leave in the spirit. The comforter would come. The Holy Spirit would come. This is all about Christ. So what we're going to be talking about to Leviticus 23. And I'll give you a moment to turn there. I hear pages rustling. Now, Leviticus 23 is where God is talking through Moses to the children of Israel. And he's letting them know something about these particular feasts. And here's what he says, starting at the beginning of the chapter. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and send, say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord. Hmm. You see, they're the feasts of the Lord because He's our Lord and Savior. These are not Jewish holidays. These are not um, things that we should uh, discount or disregard. Do you have to do them to be saved? Please say no. Yeah. No. Okay, you have to do these things to be saved. I want to be clear about that. Salvation by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. However, these are rich in our understanding and learning and relationship with God. Now, these are not the feasts of the Jewish people. These are the feasts, not even of Israel. These are the feasts of the Lord. Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations even these are my feasts. So these feasts belong to God and they're holy. These days are set apart. They're holy. Convocation means come together. On these holy days, God is saying, these are my feasts. These are holy days. You should uh, come together and proclaim them to be holy days because they belong to me and I'm going to share them with you. Okay. In the winter time, we have something else. We have a feast called, or a festival called Hanukkah. All right, so I'm going to draw a line here. Hanukkah, okay. Hanukkah happens in the winter time. And the word Hanukkah means. Dedication, or to dedicate. That's what the word Hanukkah means. Now, I'm going to shock you 
by letting you know where Hanukkah is in the Bible, but I'm going to let you think about it for a minute. Let me give you the history of Hanukkah. It was about 175 BC, and the Greeks now had conquered Jerusalem. And um, there was a uh, general by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus, when they conquered Jerusalem, went into the temple and built a statue to Zeus and sacrificed a pig in the temple. Yeah, so he brought in pagan gods and sacrificed something that God found unclean. So the temple was then made unclean by the actions of the Greeks, by the actions of Antiochus Epiphanes, okay? And a subset of Jews, um, now, none of this is in the Bible. It's in the book of Maccabees. So we have to treat it as history, not as the Holy Word of God. Some people elevate the book of Maccabees. I'm not judging anyone for that. I happen to disagree. That's okay. We're allowed to disagree. Uh, we do know it's history. We just, I just don't elevate it to the Word of God. I treat it as a history book. Just as I would a history book on the United States, it might tell what happened or a history book about... Um, the Mayflower, it's history that took place that's wonderful. It's not the Word of God. So what we see is that around 175 B.C. who lived in the hills, uh, the joke is they were the hillbillies of, uh, of the day in Jerusalem. So, you know, um, they, they might have had a couple 12 gauges. I'm not sure. I, I don't think they did, obviously. That's just a joke. Um, so the Maccabees, um, specifically Judah Maccabee, um, they faced Antioch, Antiochus Epiphanes and the Greeks, and they defeated them, and they prevailed. And what Antiochus Epiphanes had um, erected a statue to Zeus in the temple and slaughtered a pig, uh, pig's, uh, slaughtered a pig and put pig's blood all over the temple as an insult to their God and to elevate, as an insult to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and as to elevate the God of the Greeks. And what the Greeks did is they fought and they battled with them and they prevailed. And they went in and they tore down the statue, they cleaned out the pig's blood, and they Hanukkahed the temple. They Hanukkahed, they dedicated the temple. Yeah, so people think Hanukkah is Jewish Christmas. <laughs> It's not, okay? Our culture has created, uh, if you want to watch something very humorous, uh, there's a comic by the name of John Stewart, and he compares Passover and Easter and how the Gentiles have the better end of the deal with Easter over Passover. And then there's some comics out there is talking about how the Jews got the better end of Hanukkah because there's eight crazy nights and all kinds of presents for eight nights. And, the, the, you know, they out-negotiated the Gentiles. They only have one, okay? Um, yeah, none of that is what took place. Um, the addition of eight days of presents, that, that's fine. It's not in the history books. Um, what we are going to be talking about, though, is that the uh, temple... After they tore down the statue of Zeus, after they clean, uh, got rid of the pig's blood and they restored the honor to it, they Hanukkahed the temple. They dedicated the temple back to God. That's what it means. So I want you to turn, if you would, to the only place Hanukkah is mentioned in the Bible. Turn to the Gospel of John. Yeah, uh, that kind of... If you ever want to have fun with some of your uh, Jewish friends and help lead them to the Lord, um, just say, All right, yeah, let's talk about Hanukkah. I'm, I'm quite well versed in it. Uh, it's in the Gospel of John. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, you get one of those looks like, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so turn to John chapter 10, verse 22. So John chapter 10, verse 22, and I'll... Here, page is restless, so I'll give you a moment to get there. All right. And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> what does that mean? That means Yeshua, Jesus, was at the temple 
at the Feast of Dedication. Jesus was at Hanukkah and it was at the temple in wintertime. So we've got spring, summer, fall, winter. Okay. Now, something really, really, really important happens here. Okay. And we're going to read John chapter 10, verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, it was just the Jews because Israel had been scattered already. The, 12, the, 10, northern king, the, the 10 tribes in the northern kingdom had already been dispersed upon the, upon the nations. This was happening in Judea. So when it says it was the Jews, that's correct. The Jews, uh, then came the Jews round about him and said to him, How long are you going to make us wait? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believed me not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me. But you believe not, because you are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And here it comes. I and my Father are one. There is coming a day when the Antichrist is going to declare himself God. And he's actually going to walk into the temple and desecrate it. Now, we know he's going to walk into the temple and desecrate it at Passover because the two witnesses are going to be killed at Passover. That's in the book of Revelation. I believe, I can't prove it, I don't know, I believe the Antichrist is going to declare himself God at Hanukkah to captivate the Jewish people. I believe that. I could be wrong. It's... it's I'm not teaching that as Bible fact. It's just a theory. Remember, I started out, believe absolutely nothing that I say. Go home and read it for yourself, pray about it, and come to your own conclusions. The reason why I believe that is because here we see Jesus in front of the Jews, Yeshua, declaring himself to be God, and they wanted to stone him right then and there for blasphemy. So at Hanukkah, he declared himself to be God. I and the Father are one. The Antichrist is setting up a counterfeit to everything that God the Father puts out. And he is going to declare himself to be God when in fact he is the counterfeit. He's the Antichrist. Okay? This happened at Hanukkah. I believe the Antichrist is going to do it at Hanukkah as well. Declare himself and then walk into the temple at Passover. That's my belief. Could be wrong. Don't know. Stay tuned. It will reveal itself over time. Okay. Now, I and the Father are one. So what he was saying is, I am God and I am here at the Feast of Hanukkah of dedication in the wintertime and I'm declaring myself to be God. And most people, first of all, most Jews don't know that because it's in the Gospel of John. Most believers don't even know what the Feast of Dedication is. They just think Hanukkah is Jewish Christmas. Now, is Hanukkah one of the commanded feasts in Leviticus? No. You see, these seven feasts are all about God, specifically His Son. All right? These seven feasts are commanded for salvation? No. Commanded in order for us to be obedient. We're saved by faith through grace. You're not saved by keeping these feasts. I'm going to say it over and over and over again. Anytime someone introduces obedience on believers, people default into works-based salvation. That's not this at all. You're saved by faith through grace. This is just obedience unto blessing in this life and inheritance in the next life. These feasts are commanded by God as we read in the book of Leviticus. This feast is not. However, we see Christ walking in accord with this feast. In fact, at this feast, he declared himself to be God. I and the Father are one. So, do you have to keep Hanukkah to be saved? No. Do you have to keep any of those feasts to be saved? No. 
Is Hanukkah Jewish Christmas? No. <laughs> is it okay to honor Hanukkah? Absolutely. Why? Because Christ did. We're called to walk as He walks. And do we have to keep Hanukkah or any feast to be saved? Absolutely not. It's just rich with understanding of what's happening. Now, it is the dedication of the temple. Dedicating happened long before Hanukkah. This was about 175 B.C. Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And I'll let everyone have a moment to get there. So it goes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the last of the first five books of Moses, also known as the Pentateuch or the Torah. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Uh, many people view this as the uh, John 3.16 of the Old Testament. It's called the Shema, Shema Israel. Okay? And in Hebrew it says, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay? So, this is Deuteronomy 6.4, and this was what was used to teach the people and specifically a sort of a jumping off point for the, for the children. And I'll, as we read, I'll show you why. We're going to read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your strength, and all your might. These words which I command you this day are to be on your heart, and you're to teach them carefully to your children. You are to talk about them when you sit at home, when you're traveling on the road, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Tie them on your hand as a sign. Put them at the front of a headband around your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates." That was dedicating their house to the Lord. See, what they were called to do in Deuteronomy was to Hanukkah their homes, Hanukkah themselves, Hanukkah their children. Teach them. Write it on the doorposts of your house. Write it on, on, the, on, the, um, on your gates. Write it on the door frames of your homes. Dedicate your home to the Lord. Hanukkah your home, Hanukkah yourself, Hanukkah your children. It's not a retail shopping event of eight nights and um, they, there's a new menorah made up. I can't find that anywhere that the Bible condones a Hanukkah, which has nine candles. The menorah in the temple was seven candles. They now have a Hanukkah with one in the middle and four on each side, which is nine. I, I, I don't there's some folklore and tradition around that. I don't believe that that's what was going on. I believe that they were lighting the menorah on, or lighting the candles on that menorah is what I believe. I could be wrong. What we have to understand is, though, that Hanukkah was something that took place long before um, the events of the temple in 175 B.C., this was about 12 to 1300 years before that. This was written approximately 1400 um, BC. The events of Hanukkah took place around 150 to 200 BC. So we got about an 11, 1200 year window where they understood to Hanukkah or to dedicate their home. Hanukkah, dedicate themselves. Hanukkah, dedicate their children. Um, it's giving unto God in the, in the manner that God wants it. It's presenting to God the way God has asked it to be presented. It is dedicated unto the Lord. Let me give you an example. If I know that Scott likes a certain meal, and my wife and I prepare that meal specifically in mind for Scott, we could say, hey, tonight's meal, we have you in mind, Scott, because this is what you like, and this is how you like it and my wife went to great lengths to cook. Um, we had Scott and Patricia over the house and my wife made some brisket. And um, Patricia shared that um, everywhere Scott went hours before dinner, he told everyone, we're having brisket, we're having brisket. And uh, she said it was like, a, like, a, like, a, like an eight year old running around going, we're having brisket, we're having brisket, you know? And, and uh, 
he was really excited because he eats his favorite meal. He loves, he loves brisket. And uh, my wife makes fantastic brisket. It was great. And so yeah, he was so excited that, you know, he just, Patricia's like, I think he even told the guy at the, the convenience store getting gas that and, uh, we're having brisket and he was really excited um, it pleased us and it made my wife really happy to look up because he's just having seconds and you know piling it on his plates and thirds and fourths and you know I mean hey he loves brisket and my wife makes a great brisket and so you know that night we had a, we had fantastic time and it was it was it was great and um, it's the same and we present something to God in the manner that God has asked us to do it. So, for example, when a lamb was brought before the Lord for sacrifice, it had to be a year old. It had to be without spot, blemish, or defect. It had certain requirements to be acceptable unto the Lord. The requirement that God puts on us to be acceptable unto the Lord is to be covered in the atonement of His Son's blood. That is the requirement. That is pleasing unto the Lord. That is the first step. There are other steps after that that we continue to please God. So, for example, your children please you when they are obedient. And then you want to reward them. And then as they are more obedient and more responsible, you trust them with more, so you bless them with more. It's kind of like a parent who doesn't trust their children so that their inheritance, their, they appoint someone else to oversee the inheritance because they don't trust their kids. Okay? Versus someone who's, said, who's been told, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't know about you, but those are the words I'm listening. I, 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 I want to hear more than anything else. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, Hanukkah, this season is a foreshadowing of us. Now, this is where it gets interesting. We were called to dedicate our homes, Deuteronomy 6, 4. We're called to dedicate ourselves and our children, okay? And in this particular situation, it was a dedication of the, the temple, right? We see it was a dedication of the temple. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'll let everyone flip to get there. Um, the one thing I was always asked every time I come to speak at Encounter, it always seems to go, you know, Old Testament, uh, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, <laughs> New Testament, Old Testament. I, I, I can't explain it to you. I just I think God does that by design. He gives it to me to keep you going back and forth to make sure we're, you know, Fully integrated Bible. Yeah, and can have, have dexterity in our fingers. Okay, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. We're going to read the verses 19 and 20. What, what know ye not, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which, you have, which ye have from God, and you are not your own? What he's saying is, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? which is in you, the Holy Spirit's in you. Your body is a temple, and you have that from God. You, you're not your own anymore. So we are called to Hanukkah ourselves because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, came to dwell in the tabernacle in the wilderness. The Holy Spirit came to dwell in the temple of God. After the Feast of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit could dwell within man and our body is now a temple of the Lord. So we are, to, we are to dedicate our temple, our body. You see, Hanukkah isn't about our, the sun or the spirit. Hanukkah is about the temple. That's why it's not here. We do not rise to the level of God. This is holy and set apart because this is about the sun, His son. Every single one of these feasts is about His Son. We do not rise to that level. These are set apart, wholly set apart, which we are commanded to keep in Leviticus. You do not have to keep them to be saved. I've said it now, I think, for the fourth time. 
Um, five times usually gets it. We do not have to do these in order to be saved. This is just a demonstration of obedience for blessings in this life and inheritance in the next life. However, Hanukkah is a dedication of the temple. And when you look in the mirror, you should see the temple. Hanukkah is to dedicate, it's a festival to dedicate ourselves, to dedicate our homes, to dedicate our children, and that our body is a temple of the Lord. Now, verse 20. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we're presenting back unto the Father on the day of judgment ourselves. Now, I'm going to have to give an account for my wife. I'm going to have to give an account for my children. I'm going to have to give an account for how did I lead, for, for every word I said, for everything I did. I'm going to be held accountable. You may not want to be standing near me when that happens. Um, I think the sparks are going to be flying in every direction. It's, it's not going to be a, <laughs> a pretty sight. However, um, when we give that account, we have to recognize that what I'm giving back to the Father is what's already His. You see, He bought you at a price. The price was His Son's blood. He bought you at a price. You're not your own. You're His. And your body is now a temple for the Holy Spirit. The temple is where the Spirit was. And the Feast of Hanukkah is a dedication of the temple. And the winter time is when there doesn't seem to be bearing any fruit. God spoke to us through um, agriculture. It was an agricultural society. So we know in the spring, it starts to show life. The green starts to appear, the fruit. Then we know in the summer, it begins the harvest time. Okay? And he says, I come to separate the wheat from the chaff. We go from the barley harvest, which represents Israel, to the wheat harvest, which represents the Gentiles. And then we have the grape harvest at the, in the fall. And he's going to tread the wine press, as we, as we read about in Revelation. Once the harvest is over, now we're in the season of winter, and it's time to rededicate ourselves, because we get to look back on, our, on the year we've had. We get to look back on our life for that year, and it's time to dedicate ourselves. Now, it doesn't mean we just ded our, dedicate ourselves one time of year or for eight nights. We're to constantly live as living sacrifices, as Paul teaches. So we live with the spirit of Passover in us. We also live with the spirit of dedication in us. We also live with the fruits of the Spirit in us. And as we dedicate ourselves, God prunes us. And what happens when we're pruned? We bear more fruit. We, we bear more love, more joy, um, more peace. The fruits of the Spirit come up that much more. And... Uh, bear that much more fruit. Now, what's the purpose of that fruit? To bless others. Um, teaching that um, Scott said, if you ever want to have a blessing, just have in mind who you're going to bless with it <laughs> and let God do the rest. You know. And what we're called to be is obedient. And what we're called to do is to dedicate ourselves. Deuteronomy 6.4 says to write it on the door frames or the doorposts of your house and upon your gates write it into our hearts, okay? Um, those days um, of dedication is when we look back. Now, one of the things that blocks us from doing this, shame. The adversary is great at using shame to make us feel like we'll never measure up I'll give you a great response to that. You just look at the adversary and you tell him, you're right, I will never will measure up. In my flesh, I'll always fall short. Um, it is, the, 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 for lack of a better word, the tricks of the adversary, the subtleness of the adversary, to make us not want to dedicate ourselves, to, to, um, to look at our sin and feel like we have to run from God instead of running to God. And... One of the things we have to recognize is someday we will all be one with God. Okay? Turn, turn to Revelation 21. Says 
So in, in Revelation 21, it talks about the, uh, uh, the new heaven and the new earth. And sometimes in my mind, I, I, I try to envision it and I hear this dramatic music, you know, and <laughs> these trumpets and, you know, all this stuff. Um, Revelation 21, starting in verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed, passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, a band, a, a, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for, for the former things have passed away. So what we see here, shame goes away, sorrow goes away, death goes away, all of these things go away, and God is now going to Hanukkah the new heaven and the new earth dedicated unto himself because we are dedicated unto him and we're all going to be one. One last time. It's the feast of dedication. It's not Jewish Christmas. (laughs) It's been turned into another way for retailers to make money. I understand. I, I don't judge for that. I just want to make sure we understand as God's people the significance that it plays. That when the millennial reign of Christ is over, Satan, remember he was bound in chains for a thousand years, Revelation 20. Okay? And when the thousand years are up, what happens is Satan is let loose. We might as well just go back a chapter and read it. It's not in my notes, but I feel the Spirit moving me. All right. Let's go back. Revelation 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to, of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed just for a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The mark of the beast is the mark of the Antichrist, and Hanukkah was where the a foreshadowing of the Antichrist, where Antiochus Epiphanes came in to the temple in Jerusalem, erected the statue of Zeus, sacrificed a pig on the altar there, desecrating the temple. So what we see is that um, there's going to come a day what the Feast of Tabernacles represents, represents the thousand-year reign of Christ, and then we're going to permanently tabernacle with the Lord. But in between there, Satan's going to get loosed one more time and deceive the nations and desecrate the planet because it was at peace. And then when that season is over, he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire forever, and we're going to live with the Lord. And the Lord is going to Hanukkah the planet. Um, it was, um, if you jump down to verse um, 14 in Revelation chapter 20, it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And, and whosoever was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And um, we know the, that Satan is going to be Uh, cast into the lake of fire, Satan, the false prophet, and um, the beast. And when that's done, when the new Jerusalem happens in uh, Revelation uh, 21, God is then going to Hanukkah the planet. So the question then is, how do we then live in light of us being called to dedicate? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we're doing great. 
We're actually doing great on time. Normally when I'm here, <laughs> there's someone in the back of the room going, you know, hey, we've, you've, you started preaching on Tuesday. Can we wrap this up, please? Uh, just got a few more minutes here. Yeah, please turn to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1. And let's look at verse 15. So I'll let everyone get there. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Now, um, this is Paul writing to Timothy. And um, hear what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Here's the Apostle Paul who is obedient unto death. <laughs> the Apostle Paul who faced imprisonment and, and uh, persecution and even suffering unto death, uh, obedience unto death. And the Apostle Paul says, Christ came to, came to the world to save sinners. And he says, he's the chief of all sinners. He's the worst of all sinners. If the Apostle Paul is the chief of sinner, I don't even know where I, what I, I don't want to know what I, I mean, you know, I haven't been faced with that. I, I, I really want to believe, I've asked myself, you know, if, if they were to come in and say, you know, renounce your faith and you'll live, I want to believe I'd say no. I want to believe that I would just cling to Revelation 20 and, um, and 21 and have a vision for the next life and, and know that if we're beheaded, the reward in the next life is really great. So I want to believe I'd be really tough and go, hey, let me sharpen that blade for you, pal, because you know what? You know what I get in the next life? And by the way, while you're sharpening the blade, let me tell you about Christ. Yeah. Let me tell you about my Lord, because I'm so excited about this. I get to go see him. Let me tell you about it. All right. I want to believe that's me. I, I really do. Um, it may not be. I hope it is. However, Paul says that he's the chief of sinners. I believe Hanukkah as a festival of dedication is a beginning of humility. See, one of the spirits of God is wisdom, and the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And it starts with humility. I also believe that those of us who are called to teach, Scott, myself, and others, have to confess our sins and say we fall short. So when you look at someone at the podium, um, think about that verse where Paul says he's the chief of sinners. When you look at myself or Scott or someone who is presenting, it's important that you in the audience and you at home know that I'm someone up here who's just as fallen as you. And I struggle, I'm Israel, I wrestle with God. My spirit man wants to walk in peace with God and my flesh wants to wrestle with God and wants to rebel. Now, to him who overcomes, there's a prize, there's a reward. As we overcome sin in our life, okay, there's blessing, there's reward, there's freedom in that and we walk in freedom and grace and maturity. However, in the meantime, we make a mess of things. Mm -hmm. We make a mess of things and we have to love each other, we have to forgive each other. I think it's important that people up here at the podium let the people out there know that I'm a sinner too and I struggle. Um, it's an ongoing daily thing. I know it's going to happen sometime after. I, it, it, the struggle will stop sometime after 86. I don't know when. <laughs> if you're watching at home or you missed it, and rewind. It's a funny joke. Um, what matters most is that we're... we're in the Feast of Dedication, that we recognize that we all got to dedicate ourselves. And those who lead from the Word of God and teach from the Word of God are held to a higher standard. I think it's a shame when someone has a, a, a falling that we discard them in the body. I think that they now have a testimony because you know what? I was thinking about it. Um, I was thinking about like a really, a, a person that everyone would know would be a really bad guy. And I thought about John Gotti. You know, he was a gangster, uh, Al Capone, these guys who, who committed murder and killed people and ordered people killed. Do you realize I have more in common with John Gotti than I do with God? 
that you have more in common with Al Capone than you do with God, that your flesh brings you closer to that person, even though you may be more mature in the faith, will never be where God is. And that we have to have the humility to recognize we all fall, all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. And that to dedicate ourselves means that we confess our sins to one another. We pray for one another, lift each other up. There's this... Um, I went, I went to YouTube the other day. To, I was really interested in um, what some, uh, a teacher had to say. And I called it up on YouTube. And it's amazing. For every, every teaching out there, there's 11 teachings explaining why that guy's a heretic. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wow. It's just believers tearing down other believers or believers judging other believers. There is to be no judgment. Um, you know, these are Sabbaths of the Lord. And Colossians 2 says there's to be no judgment in regard to a Sabbath, a holy day, a festival. People who disagree with me aren't to judge me, and people I disagree with, I'm not to judge them. We're not to judge each other. We're to encourage each other to strive on in the faith. We're to lift each other up with prayer. We're to um, be there for, for we're one body. Warring against the body is not there. Do we sometimes have to correct people? Yes. Do we sometimes have to discipline people? Yes. We, and we're to do it in love. The other day I wanted to... Um, discipline someone and my wife reminded me perhaps we should consider their struggles maybe we need to encourage them maybe we need to consider where they're at in life she's right she's right so with that I want us to close with this as we are entering into the season of dedication we recognize the feasts of the Lord are commanded in Leviticus 23 they all represent uh, the Son uh, our Lord our Savior and it, also the Holy Spirit. The Feast of Dedication represents God's workmanship, the temple, and you. We're to dedicate our homes, Deuteronomy 6.4. We're to dedicate the little ones, our children. We're to dedicate ourselves. And someday God is going to Hanukkah, dedicate the planet, the new Jerusalem, the new earth, back unto himself. Between now and that day, we're to repent. We're simply to repent, to grow in, grow in our faith, grow in maturity, grow in grace, love one another, walk as Christ taught us to walk, have the humility to admit, you know what, we all fall short. Uh, as you watch at home or watch here, you're listening to a sinner who falls short every day. And the only thing we can really do is pray for each other, repent, teach each other, walk together, and do the best we can to lead each other towards um, a purity in our faith. And with that, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we, uh, we're humbled that you allow us to uh, approach the, th the throne of grace boldly and that you've made a way through your Son and that we're grateful that the curtain was torn and that we can come to you as your people. And as we enter into this season of dedication, as we strive to Hanukkah ourselves, as we see our Lord was at the, uh, the temple during the Feast of Dedication and declared Himself to be God in the flesh and Your Son. We're mindful that You've called us to walk the way He walked. So Father, let us honor the commandment, the greatest commandment, to love You above all others and to love our neighbor as ourself. And for that, Father, we just ask that you continue to show us grace and mercy in how we walk and lead us towards uh, a holiness and a righteousness that we would love one another, not ever judge each other, but to lift each other up with prayer and to be there for one, one another, to be one body. We know we fall short, and if, if Paul says he's the chief of sinners, then have mercy on the rest of us, Father. We know that you, um, you love us and that you want us to do good works. You've called us to do good works. And the more we Hanukkah ourselves, the more we're able to do that. So, Father, we love you. We give you all the praise and glory. And we lift this up to you in the name of Yeshua, the name above all names, the Christ our Lord. Amen. It's been my privilege and pleasure to be here today. And uh, as I told you before, don't believe anything I say. And between now and next time, go home, read your Bible. <laughs>